Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, so today, uh, we're happy to show a talk uh, by Jean uh, Van Bronckhorst, if I said that correctly. Awesome. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you for everyone coming. Uh, today was uh, brought to you by uh, so Jean and uh, Neuroscience Research Group. Um, and today, we're going to be talking about dreams. Yeah. So this is a club uh, where we talk about um, the brain and experience and the mind, and we try to bring all these stuff together uh, to show new perspectives, new things to you know think about. And we are going to be definitely hosting more uh, events and membership uh, opportunities. Um, so anyone that wants to see more of these events, you can just put your email in the comments, and we'll just add you to our mailing list. Um, so yeah, so Jean's going to be talking about dreams and, uh, thank you everyone for, everyone for coming today and thank you, Jean. Welcome. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so my name is Jean and just to give you a little background, I'm not a neuroscientist, so forgive me for the things I don't know. <laughs> I have put this talk together with, uh, the questions about the mind and science um, up front. Um, so we're gonna start with there. I have a background in medical social work. So I spent a lot of time in medicine, um, 20 years altogether, 10 years in uh, hospice. And at that point started talking with people about dreams and found that dreams at the end of life are really become quite amazing and comforting for people. Um, and from there I, started writing. I wrote a couple books, um, which are still available. <laughs> but I'm also part of the International Association for the Study of Dreams, which is a really cool organization. We have a lot of scientists, a lot of researchers, clinicians, shamans, dream workers, and just people who are interested in dreams all together. They have an APA journal called Dreaming, um, for members and it's a like I said a volunteer organization so if you're interested in that there'll be information about that at the end and with that I am going to pull up my here sorry I'll just do slideshow okay so there we are. So from there, so what I'm going to be doing tonight, kind of a quick history of dreams in Western culture, uh, which can go a long way to explaining why we don't know very much about them now. Um, kind of what some of the recent research is showing between the mind and the brain and dreams. Um, I'm going to talk some about bad dreams um, and nightmares since those, especially now during the pandemic, people are uh, having more bad dreams, more dreams in general and more bad dreams, and we'll talk about kind of what you can do with that. And ultimately, my main thing is just knowing that the dreams are us. They, they, can, they can link us to amazing places. They can be spiritually transformative, but they are us. They are our minds. They're our hearts. Um, and we can build a partnership with them. We don't have to be at their mercy, and we don't have to let go of them and, and pretend they're not there. There is kind of this golden place in between that I really like. So the first thing is who we are. We are a monophasic culture. And I got this from Charles Laughlin, who is an anthropologist who studied neuroscience. Um, and he was talking about the difference between monophasic and polyphasic cultures. Western society, definitely monophasic. We tend to think of consciousness as oriented to the physical world. Science is oriented to the physical world for the most part. Um, even when you're talking about psychology and the science in psychology, there's a huge number of people who are looking at um, psychology in terms of the brain or in terms of behavior and trying to stay out of the wishy-washy realms of feelings, um, which is kind of too bad, but there we are. Um, so reality is perceived through the five senses. And in our society, dreams really are not considered relevant to our functioning or to the development of our identity. And you can see this really easily. If you think about how many times as a child you've had a bad dream and your parents said, oh, don't worry, it's just a dream. It's not real. 
it, it won't hurt you. It's not a real thing. It's just a fantasy. We don't learn about dreams in school. We don't learn about dreams in the religions. Um, they just are considered irrelevant in a lot of ways. In medicine, the same way, I found that dreams really are considered irrelevant to treating physical disease. Polyphasic cultures, on the other hand, as you can see, they tend to orient not just to physical, but also to the non-physical. That the reality, the shared reality, can be perceived through altered states of consciousness. So in these cultures, people can get together at night in a mutual dream and make decisions for the society. And if you wake up the next morning and you haven't been a part of that, it's literally you snooze, you lose. That <laughs> people kind of look at you funny that you weren't there to pay it to pay attention to that. Dreams are considered important and vital for society's functioning and for their identity. So these kind of altered states of consciousness, they show up in Western culture. We know about them. We just they're just considered more of a subculture. But when you think about um, trance states meditation states, drug states, drug, uh, driven visions, um, or ordeal-driven visions. If you go out on a quest and you don't eat for four or five days, you can get visions that way. Um, so there are a lot of ways that we can change the way we perceive reality. We just don't, as a culture, tend to think of them as um, the correct way to be in relationship with other people in the society. They're all kind of a tune in, drop out kind of thing. So this one got me. I wondered how to get here because there are 4,000, more than 4,000 different cultures on the planet today, living cultures, and 90% of them seek out experiences in other states of consciousness and especially in dreams. So in a lot of ways, while Western culture is big and it really is all that most of us have grown up with, most that I have grown up with, um, it really is just one culture among many. So in some ways, we're, we've kind of lost this ability to think about dreams. Um, and part of this, it wasn't always the case. Western culture really did start out with dreams being important. I think one of the reasons dream workers go back to the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans is because those were times when dreams were considered a part of the culture, were considered um, important for healing and important for looking at the future. I think part of the problem was the early Christian church as it was codifying and growing. The Christian church really made villains of anything that was not part of that, um, that religion. And so... The, they started thinking of intuition and dreams as being part of satanic forces and everything villain in itself is kind of an old word for villager <laughs> and it has, it has taken on sinister components. So we really became more leery about it. We started uh, thinking, uh, people started thinking of healers as witches and then came the witch burnings and thankfully enlightenment came along and with the scientific revolution, with the uh, science, we kind of threw out the idea that there were satanic forces that were um, at work against us. And we threw out the idea that there were witches that were able to cast spells on us. We also threw out dreams. We threw out healing. We threw out intuition, everything. That's where we made that big jump into physical senses only. We're going to follow a scientific method. And that was true right up until... Ah, these two gentlemen came along. The one on the right is uh, Mr. Freud, Dr. Freud, and the one on the left is Dr. Jung. And they really began this idea that, well, Freud in particular, began the idea that dreams could be understood, they could be meaningful, and they could be analyzed according to a particular uh, process. And that with them, they could be used to help people understand their lives better. And that was huge. He talked about dreams on that they had two levels to them. He called it the manifest level, which was the dream imagery itself, and then the latent, which was a level that played with the images, played with the puns and the metaphors that he knew could only, and he taught, could only be understood really by a psychoanalyst who had been trained. 
Now Jung had a slightly different idea about dreams. He was talking about, uh, he was more interested in kind of the spiritual side of dreams, the, the dreams that were life transforming. They called them, he called them big dreams. And he talked about dreams as being, as having in them symbols and metaphors that not only were individual, but actually touched on what he called archetypes, or these meanings that could be found in cultures around the world. Now for both of them, 19th century educated men, they both had really a strong education in Roman and Greek myths. So when they talked about this and they wrote about this, they used that language to explain how these complexes and archetypes worked, which was great for them. Um, but for us, we're farther away from that kind of a, what they called a classic education. So in a lot of ways, the archetypes feel even farther away now than they did before. And I'm not sure that we need a Roman and Greek understanding of uh, in order to understand our dreams anymore. Um, but that's what they did. And there are people who are still um, learning the archetypes in order to understand their dreams better. Now, they had a couple of drawbacks to this. These are the two unintended consequences, I think, that came out of it. Um, they said both of these things, but I don't think they understood how much it was going to scare people. This idea that dreams are going to reveal against our will, they're going to reveal repressed urges and taboos and sexual drives and, and um, hostile drives that are going to make us look bad, going to make us feel bad if we ever pay attention to them. And we have this idea that somehow our dreams are not just things that we don't really pay attention to, but now they're a deep, dark, unknowable. Um, and that they really can only be understood by a highly trained and skilled analyst. So it took the dreams out of the hands of the dreamers. And in a lot of ways, it left people feeling like they were kind of at the mercy of these hidden aggressions. Um, and that's really too bad. It has led to a lot of people saying, do not try this at home. Do not try to understand your dreams. Just don't pay attention to them. Um, and for heart science, of course, uh, dreams just were unresearchable at this point. Dreams, uh, they said, what's the difference between a dream and remember the dream? Is there a difference? Is the dream the memory of it? Or is the dream what happens inside when we can't reach it? Or is the dream the telling of it, which is after the memory of it? Because often with dreams, our memories of them are can be very profoundly uh, moving but to try and put that in words, they often lose uh, a lot of their power. So you can say, I dreamed of a dog. And somebody's like, yeah, okay. I said, no, it was, a, it was a dog, like my childhood dog. And they said, okay. So you can't, it's really hard to convey the, the emotional power that comes from them. And so hard science kind of stepped away from it, really. And in stepping away from it said, dreams are meaningless, dreams aren't, aren't necessary, dreams are irrelevant. Until we got to the 1950s and we started looking at sleep. Now, sleep science is the place where they first started noticing. And this was a, a researcher who was a, a student, started notice, noticing that when the people were sleeping, every now and then their eyes would start moving, twitching back and forth, back and forth, really, really fast under their eyelids. And he called it rapid eye movement. They started waking people up and finding out that when they woke people up in the middle of a rapid eye movement, they were having a dream. They were in the middle of a dream. And it was the first time people started putting dreams and, uh, and science together. I don't know if that makes sense, but it was the first time they really started thinking, maybe we can study this after all. Um, and that's when things really took off. They started interrupting sleep and they found sleep deprivation. They let people sleep and interrupted their REM sleep and found sleep deprivation. So that if you slept all night, but you just got interrupted out of your dreams, you would get sleep deprived. And they thought that was, I mean, that is very interesting. They found that if you, um, if you took a bunch of students and you had them study and then take a test, they did okay. But if they studied and then they slept for an hour and then took the test, they did much better. Now they're just talking about sleep there. But, and I'll show you in a minute, 
they found that in that sleep, people were dreaming about, <laughs> about the things they were studying. So that dreaming was actually helping people promote memory function formation, not just sleep, but actual dreaming. And that the dreaming really does help the mind and us process um, information from our waking life, especially experiences with those strong emotional charges. So we'll go into more depths there. Here's something I got off the internet that looked pretty good to me. This is kind of what sleep stages look like when you go through the night. So at the bottom there is the hours of sleep. So you can see that as time goes on, as we're sleeping, the REM happens a few, uh, four or five times a night, um, but it tends to come more often and last longer the farther you get into the sleep cycle, which is really important because it's that last one there that people will remember most when you're, when you're just waking up. Now, if you're not sleeping eight hours, if you're sleeping five hours, say, or you're sleeping four and a half hours, or you're sleeping six hours, which is what the world was doing uh, before the pandemic, you're going to have less REM time. You're going to feel more sleep deprived. But we actually, a couple years ago, there was a, a researcher who was saying that not only were people sleep deprived, they were getting dream deprived. So people, researchers were noticing this. Um, because people were sleeping in such short cycles, they weren't getting the full REM sleep. So what happened during the pandemic? People's schedules changed. They started sleeping longer hours. They were waking up naturally instead of by alarm clocks, so they weren't being jolted out of sleep. And because they're anxious because of the pandemic, people started remembering dreams. People Dreams kind of exploded for a while, and people were feeling quite overwhelmed. I don't know if you remember that, but in April and May and June, there were all kinds of articles and papers around the world of, oh my God, there's, death. there's nightmares. Why are people having nightmares? Why are people sleep dreaming? And it was because they had, they had better sleep and they had sleep that was waking up naturally. So that's, I think, all I want to say about that. Um, a couple, one more thing. They did find they were very excited about this, um, that the REM sleep were the time when people dreamed. And it is true that REM sleep tends to have the dreams that are more story-like, that are more narrative-driven, that have the plots, they're more vivid, they tend to have more emotions. But they're not the only time people dream. In fact, it took until just a few years ago, but they started waking people up during the non-REM times, and lo and behold, they found, they found dreams there too. The dreams in non-REM stages tend to be shorter, more snippets, uh, less emotional, but they are there. And that is, that is something really interesting. So we are dreaming throughout the night. Now this particular graph is something, this is for adults and actually for children down to the age of about two and a half. So about two and a half is when we start seeing this kind of a pattern where there's REM happening four or five times a night and that it takes about 20, 25% of the sleep period. For babies and infants up to about two and a half years old though, they get much, much more REM. They can spend um, more than 50% of their sleep in REM. In fact, some studies are saying it was closer to 80%. So they think that the REM sleep has something to do with the formation of the brain and the, and the growth of the brain. Um, and that at two and a half is when it generally closes off again. Okay. I can't do science without mice. <laughs> I have decided this is true. So I'll go, I'll give you the lab rat thing. So this they thought was really interesting is that they did this is in 2001, there were researchers at MIT and they used what they're called microprobes to monitor the individual neurons in the brains of rats. So they put the mice through a maze and they saw the, the place cells. So I'm gonna read this. Among these were place cells in the hippocampus and they, these place cells pulse electricity when the rat traversed each turn in the maze. So every turn got a different impulse that was a different pulse of the uh, place cells in the hippocampus um, as they were finding their food. And then what they found is when the, when the rats were sleeping, these same patterns appeared again. 
So they think that the rats were dreaming about Hermaeus because the same images were showing up in the same, in the same pattern, as if the brain was replaying the maze pattern and relearning it. So they also said that um, the same thing was found in a human being. So there was a woman who uh, had, a, had similar probes inserted as part of her brain surgery, and they asked if they could, could watch this, and they gave her a story. Um, so they gave her a sequence of images that were presented to her in a story form, and they watched the neurons firing, these same place cells pulsing. Um, and then later, as, they, as she slept, the same neurons were firing in the same sequence, and she said, yes, she was dreaming about this. So they think that those things are happening all the time. Now, interesting part of this, too, let me see if this is the right place to put this. Um, the maze, they looked at the rats in both non-REM and REM sleep. And in non-REM sleep, the dreams, the firings were happening exactly as they had learned in the maze. But in the REM sleep, I thought this was really interesting, that the pulses were happening sometimes by the, the pattern that they had just learned, but sometimes they went back to other patterns they had learned in other, in other mazes. And so all of a sudden in the REM sleep, they were seeing the patterns kind of mix and converge and come back and form new patterns. But what they think was happening was that they were looking, that the rats were not just dreaming about the particular maze, but were dreaming about mazes in general. And if you think about the way that our brains work in terms of figuring out problems, that whole thing about sleeping on sleeping on a problem or, or trying to come to something is this REM sleep. We do the problems, the tasks, but what, and then everything kind of stretches out, and you've got this 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 seeking out of other experiences, past experiences that are like the thing that you're studying, like the thing that you're focused on, but not quite the same. It's like you're playing this game of, is it like this? Is it like that? Is it like this other thing? And we're looking for the generalizations, the patterns that fit our lives. So I just thought that was amazing. And we have seen this in people as well. There's people in the maze. So they did a virtual maze task. Um, and they found that, um, so they put people through a virtual maze. They asked them, they slept on it, they had control groups. They had some people who, when they woke up, said they did not dream about the maze, and some people they woke up who said, yes, I dreamed about the maze. And the people who remembered the dreams about the maze improved their memory of it by 10 times, which is significant. That's a lot, so they were very excited about that. They also noticed that these dreams also happened in non-REM and REM with no real difference between the two that the maze, the people who were dreaming about the maze were dreaming about it through the night. I wanna talk some about metacognition because it's something that we don't really talk about much in dreams, but this whole idea of us being aware of ourselves and aware of our thinking process um, happens in dreaming as well. We usually think about dreams, the kind of stereotype of dream is it's surreal, it's odd, it's, you know, something really wacky, and our dreams are too crazy to predict. But really, we have a lot of ourselves in our dreams. And these particular things, we can think about our own dreaming when we're in a dream. Not so much that we're aware of it, but we can think, huh, okay, I know how this works. We can be of our waking self. We can evaluate our relationships. Oh, I'm dreaming about this person, but I think they died. It's so wonderful to see them again. We can remember past dreams. Oh, I've been in this place before. Here I am, I'm walking down the street. I remember this street. I think I've dreamed about this street before. So you can do all of this without really bringing yourself out of the dream. Um, it's not quite being lucid, but it's close. It's kind of on that continuum of lucidity. And that is huge, the lucidity in dreams. I love this picture. I don't know how they got this picture, but I love it. <laughs> it's kind of what being fully lucid in a dream feels like. It's like this sense, the first time it happens, it's like, holy crap, I'm not where I thought I should be. So <laughs> that's kind of look I think he has. Um, lucidity in dreams 
there are, it, it comes in a continuum. So part of that metacognition we were talking about um, is part of that continuum. As you become more awake and more aware, you actually do have the ability to control parts of the dream. So for a lot of us, um, we're kind of in the lower level of the continuum. So if you break it down into like seven different stages, the first stage is in dreaming is you're not actually present in the dream. The dream is vague. You wake up. I, there was something about chasing. There was something about chasing going on. Um, in the next level, you're present, but only as an observer. And the content, content has some details. Like I see someone being chased by a monster. In the third stage, you don't have any power, but you're a character in the dream. I'm being chased by a monster. I can't get away. So you're running, but you just can't get away, and that feeling of panic is there. By the fourth stage, you've got some awareness and some agency. Uh, a monster chases me in my house. I decide my best option is to hide in the basement, or the monster's looking for me. I'm going to run downstairs and, and look for the car keys. So you've got in that dream, someone is aware enough of themselves to start making decisions about how they want to move and what they want to do. The next level of lucidity, you gain full control within the dream. The monster is chasing me. I'm locking all my doors to the house. Monster has to leave me alone. Done and done. <laughs> and there's a real sense of agency there. The next level up, you can gain process over, uh, gain control over the process of dreaming itself. So a monster gets into my house. I pause the dream. I'm going to give myself a chance to escape, or I'm going to turn around and tell them to stop chasing me, or I'm going to just switch everything and, and go to the beach instead. I don't like monsters in my house. So at this point, I have awareness of myself. I have awareness of the dream, and I have awareness of being a, enough outside the dream that I can cause the dream to change. Then the last one is you consciously co-create the dream. And that's where someone says, I'm awake. I know I'm awake. I'm going to spend this time exploring. I don't really care what the dream is doing. <laughs> oh my gosh, I can touch metal. It feels cold. <laughs> or I'm going to take this opportunity to go fly into the stars. Or I'm going to take this opportunity. I'm awake now. So I'm going to go back in time to my family childhood home and see if I can figure out what was going on between my siblings. So at that point, the dreamer has what feels like full control, even though there's still a dream going on around them, you can, still, you can still respond to the dream images, but you have enough control that you can, you can make big, big changes. And that feels like a peak experience. That's what some researchers call, it's just there's a giddiness to it. Um, I have felt that I woke up from one and thought it's like being a little uh, high on champagne. It's just like this bubbly, fizzy feeling of so much power and energy in the dream. And then you wake up and you feel like you can do that in your real life as well, in your waking life as well. So why people like love lucid dreaming is for that high, for that peak experience. They love to play. They love to explore the consciousness. And some people have actually gone to looking for spiritual growth at that time. So there's Robert Wagner, uh, who's a famous uh, lucid, dream, lucid dreamer and explorer. He says when he becomes lucid like that, he actually starts talking to the dream and asking the dream or what is making the dream questions. So when he's lucid, he'll say, tell me about what life means. Tell me about how this works. And he will, he will ask the dream to direct him at that way. So it's pretty amazing. And all of this is still really new because before, before Stephen LaBerge came along in the 70s and said, I can be lucid in my dream and communicate with you, the researcher, outside the dream, they didn't know that this was possible. They thought it was just a fantasy. But he actually could go to sleep and they would give him, when his eyes started going back and forth, they would give him a pattern to follow, and they would tell him, you know, follow four minus two, show me that pattern. And he would give the pattern with his eyes. He would just move his eyes back and forth um, to give that pattern. So once they realized that the consciousness really does go back and forth, 
um, that easily. It kind of opened the door to more lucid dreaming. And it's really taken off with uh, virtual reality. The gamers love lucid dreaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm not absolutely sure why that is, but they do. So, yeah. Okay, wait a minute. I think I turned too many pages here. All right. So I'm going to go on now to bad dreams and nightmares. One thing we know about lucid dreams, the more lucid you are, the number of bad dreams and nightmares just goes down to zero. Because why would you have a bad dream? If you can control the dream, that's what people do. They control it and they go on a merry way. But bad dreams and nightmares do happen. Um, and it's probably the biggest question that we get asked is not so much how to play, but how to manage uh, bad dreams. And part of it is because bad dreams, how do I want to say this? So the difference between bad dreams and nightmares, bad dreams are the dreams you wake up from and think, ugh, that was, that was just terrible. That was just gross. I just didn't like that. Nightmares are dreams that have such a, an, a, an emotional power to them that you actually wake up to get out of them. They're so scary that you're actually pushing the escape button and you wake up out of it with that. Um, uh, most of us have bad dreams at some point, but I think all of us have bad dreams, but we don't often have them very, very frequently. I think it's like once a week, a couple times a month, maybe. Um, there are more bad dreams uh, for children, um, and the children, usually by the time they're 11 or 12, they think that the bad dreams kind of simmer down because there's a, a maturation that's going on in the brain that lets people hold on to their emotional lives and get their thinking logical part working. So if you think about this, I'm, I think I've got my pages mixed up. Just a second here. Okay, so you think about it. Um, one of the researchers was talking about bad dreams happen because there's a disconnect between the amygdala, the amygdala, that's the way you pronounce that, right? And the frontal cortex, which has the logical, um, the logic place, the place that is narrative and the calming and the, the container, the judgment place. The amygdala has a lot of the emotions and especially fear. Fear is really big there. So when they're disconnected and the amygdala is going with the dreams, you will get more of a fear response. You'll get more anxiety dreams. You'll get dreams where if things are just hard. Um, and as people, as children get older, that connection becomes stronger between the frontal cortex and the amygdala. And so they're able to handle their emotions better in the waking. And I think in some ways also better in the sleeping, in the dreaming. I also think this is part of why Western culture has so many more bad dreams is because we also have let go of those neural pathways that could connect those two more strongly in the, in the sleep state. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, let's see. So responding to bad dreams. I think there are, I have come across three different ways that people respond to bad dreams. Um, the first way is uh, clinically through kind of a counseling approach. So you think about anxiety dreams. Um, I don't know how many of you have had an anxiety dream. I assume most of us have where you are out of college by decades, but all of a sudden you're having a dream about showing up for a test and you haven't studied and there's that sense of anxiety from that. The anxiety dreams often come when we are stressed. So the pandemic dreams... Um, um, often are highly anxious dreams um, because we're facing such a, a threat. So we will dream about that. And part of that is to, as I show now, to blow off a little steam, um, trying to find ways to manage our emotions within the dream. Ernst Hartman is a dream researcher, and he talked about um, nightmares and bad dreams as a way to uh, kind of take that initial sense of, uh, fear or anger or anxiety and again spread it out among your whole life so 
here's a horrible thing that happened. Maybe it's like this. Maybe it's like that time this happened. Maybe it's like something you read. Maybe it's like some, a monster you saw. And in that way, your brain circuitry is kind of looking for all the different um, experiences that you've had to understand this particular uh, nightmare. So a doctor I talked to once talked about you know, when he's in a stressful situation, he often dreams about uh, one of the first surgeries that he performed and how anxious he was. And that it went well. When he wakes up, he remembers it went well. But it's that sense of um, whatever this situation is, is reminding him of that situation. So the anxiety shows up in, in all our anxious um, moments. And let's see, we also talked some about not just anxiety, but just strong emotions in general. When people dream after um, traumatic events, they are not generally dreaming about the event itself. Uh, if it's just post-trauma, not post-traumatic, but just their post-trauma, they will dream about the meaning of that event more than they'll dream about the event itself. So a clinician in California uh, talk to people who had survived a wildfire. Now, if you think about dreams in terms of just images and random images, you might think that they would dream then about fires or about orange or about heat, but they don't. What they do is they dream about being threatened. They dream about being overwhelmed. So while they had a fire, they might dream about other natural disasters instead, like tsunamis or earthquakes or their house falling down. So that the, the part that our, our dreams are working on is the emotional resonance of the experience. Now, when you get into post-trauma, post-traumatic stress dreams, um, then what happens is you're starting to see people dreaming much more about the event itself. And in fact, if you're looking at PTSD dreams, their dreams are like flashbacks in that they are dreaming over the most uh, the most scary or hardest part of that time. They'll dream that moment over and over again, and they'll dream it just as it shows up. So it doesn't, it doesn't change. It's only later as, as people begin to kind of incorporate the trauma into their lives that those dreams will change and start incorporating other parts of their lives into them as well. So they don't know which came first, chicken or the egg on that. Um, but they do see it when post-traumatic dreams start changing and start responding to what's happening during their current waking life, that that's when that um, healing has started. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, okay, good. I can see a couple people nodding. Oh, well, we can see a couple people, <laughs> but they're nodding, so we're good. <laughs> okay. Another way to think about dreams is uh, nightmares is that we really can strengthen and create and build those neural pathways between the emotional and the reflective process. I think just as it happens with children as they're naturally maturing through, through time, we can do this. And this is what Laughlin was talking about in his book, the anthropologist who was talking about uh, neurology and, the, and the, the different cultures. He thinks what's happened is because people are allowed to go back and forth between dreaming and talking about their dreams, sharing the dreams, going back and, and intending to dream, that what they're doing is, is they're strengthening those neural pathways. It's like, it's like learning to play an instrument or learning to drive, that it's clunky at first, but the more you do it, the more you get that hand-eye coordination working, the more it gets incorporated into the neural pathways and it does actually make dreams more story-like. It makes them more coherent, makes them more attuned to our ego waking concerns um, and less fantastical in terms of uh, monsters chasing us. So that's something we can do. Um, and with that then, when you've got that going, then you're, you can do uh, that thing where you can turn around and change the dream. So I'll give you an example. I had, a, you know, I had a recurring nightmare when I was a child up until I was 25, I think, where I was getting chased by Bigfoot because I, I lived in the Northwest at the time in Seattle. And, and I would be running for my life and just, just terrified. Um, and one day I was talking about it to a friend of mine. She said, well, well, why is he chasing you? 
And I said, I don't know. <laughs> it's just chasing me. It's a, it's a nightmare. I said, well, why don't next time he chases you, why don't you turn around and ask? And I, you know, my first thought, it was like 1980. I was like, is that even legal? Are you allowed to turn around and ask your dreams? I was like, I don't know. So I thought, well, I'll try it. And I had enough neural pathways. I had enough of an ability to understand who I was in my dreams that the very next time I had this dream and I was running, it was just like every other time. And I thought, well, maybe I'll just try this. So I turned around and kind of put my hands up and said, why are you chasing me? <laughs> and he stopped and he said, well, you wanted me to, didn't you? He said, I've been guarding your treasure. I've been protecting your treasure. I just wanted to show you how I was chasing everybody else away this whole time. And <laughs> it was like, I was like doubled over because I was breathing so hard. And I kind of looked up and said, okay, good job. And, and then it was like, what treasure? <laughs> show me the treasure. So he was walking me back through the woods and showing me how he was doing this. And, and he was my guardian. He was a protector. And he showed me the treasure. And it was wonderful. And I never had the dream again. And whenever I have a dream now, I think since then, maybe five times I've had a dream of somebody chasing me or threatening me. And each time I turn around and say, just stop it. <laughs> and they do because they're my dream images because dreams are coming because they're mine, because they're trying to tell me something, because they're trying to help. And basically the underlying theme about dreams is they are always coming for our benefit. No matter what you're seeing, they are coming to try and help us in some way. Whether it's their understanding of help or my understanding of help, the more we can talk to them, the more we can be aware of them, the more we can go back and forth between waking and sleeping, the easier it is to find out what that help is. So some people don't want to do that work. They don't want to think about the metaphors. They don't want to go into depth. They just, they're tired. They're done with the dreams. And you know what? You can extinguish a nightmare. And it's actually not hard. There's a lot of research about this. It's called image rehearsal therapy. So what you have to do is you have to stop saying to yourself, it's only a dream and push it away. What you have to do instead is think, change one thing in the dream. You get to take your agency in this place. And you say, I will change one thing in the dream. The therapist don't care. You don't even need a therapist. Nobody cares what you change. You can change the color of the wallpaper. You can change how you, how you decide to respond to it. You can change the ending. You can change the middle. It doesn't matter. What you do is you think about it twice a day for five minutes. You just rehearse the new dream as you want it to go. And that's it. Twice a day, five minutes. Rehearse the dream as you want it to go, not as it has before, but as you want it to go. And your dreaming brain will follow. It will either follow and give you the dream that you have imagined, or the whole thing will just shut down, will just extinguish, and you can go on and do other things. And this, there's a, a psychologist in, oh, where is he in? I think he's in St. Louis, Missouri, and he basically made an app for this, and he gave it to college students. He never checked in with them. He never talked to them about it. He never showed them how to do it. He just said, just what I just said, just change the dream twice a day, five minutes at a time. He came back to them six months later and said, how are your nightmares? And they were all gone. It's like everybody did it and they did it for a few days. It just, it just doesn't take much time. It's just, it's like a whole cultural mindset that has to change from these are too scary, they have to go away, I'm gonna do anything else to avoid them, to I'm gonna take some control, I'm gonna take some agency, and I can do this and they will respond to me. So that is the power of dreams. And with that comes to the continuity hypothesis, which is gaining ground everywhere, though there's a lot of uh, discussion and argument about what continuity implies how they're defining it. But basically, there is a true and deep consistency between our waking lives and our dreaming lives, even if we can't see it at the front. They often are responding to what we've been doing, what we've been thinking, what we've been feeling, um, whether those things are deep spiritual questions and beliefs that we have and values, or whether they are what we had for dinner the night before or what we watched on TV before we went to bed. 
I'm going to talk to a young girl who was talking about, I always see vampires. I see vampires and I see ghouls and I see bloodthirsty things. I said, what kind of movies do you like? She goes, oh, I love those vampires and ghouls and bloodthirsty things. I said, okay. So you're training your brain. What images you like to see? What images will, will talk to you, speak to you most clearly about what you're facing? If you change those images, the images in your, in your uh, dreams will change as well. So I think this is one of those wonderful things. And they have found that um, contrary to this kind of popular idea of dreams being surreal, they often are about things that we love doing or things that we do do during the day. They often include people that we know. They often include landscapes that are familiar. Even if you're, I'm walking down a, a city street and I don't recognize the city at all, it still looks at, as a, like a recognizable city street to me. There are buildings on either side. There's pavement. I'm walking on the pavement. If I'm in a bicycle that turns into a tricycle, those things are still recognizable to me. We generally um, pay attention to gravity in our dreams. We generally, our dreams follow kind of what we expect from our waking life experience. Even if we have flying dreams, which are wonderful, I have to say, um, the flying dream, the exhilaration comes from that sense of lifting out of gravity. So places where dreams are less continuous that way uh, with waking life are where they start speaking in metaphors. But even those, they're often metaphors that we recognize. So somebody had a dream about, you know, seeing his grandmother and he had a bag and he had, and a cat started coming out of the bag, got escaped from the bag. And, and then he woke up and he thought, okay, so I've let the cat out of the bag on that one. You know? So it's like even just playing with the, playing with the images, saying them out loud sometimes will give you the sense of what they're meaning. Still, recognizable cat, recognizable bag, recognizable grandmother in a landscape setting that was completely familiar and following the laws of gravity. It's like all those things we don't really pay attention to in dreams, but are, are still a part of them. They are, they're not as surreal as most of them are not. And I'm going to talk some about dreams of connection because this is one of those places where one of the, the benefits of dreams, one of the ways we just don't think about them very much is how much they can connect us with people that we love and miss. And we will dream about people that we miss, whether they've moved to the other side of the country, whether they have died, whether they've gone to war. In fact, war dreams in particular became very, very, um, I wouldn't say popular, more common. Uh, when you're dreaming about people that you're worried about, dreaming of people you haven't seen. We do reach out in our dreams to try and make sure we're okay, to see each other one more time, to say something we needed to say, to understand our relationships better. It is one of, it's a common and, and um, precious, I think, gift that we have in our dreams. And really, there are so many more dreams that I really am not going to go into. They don't have a lot of uh, science behind them because we're still at the very beginning of looking at dreams. Really, 40 years we've been looking at dreams um, in the scientific side. But all of these types of dreams have happened um, and are, are, there are anecdotes about them and there are personal experiences about them. I've talked about some of them. At the end of life, people often have... Um, dreams that help them prepare for the end of life. As a hospice worker, I can tell you that the dreams become, um, they really do follow a particular procession. So at the end of life, people will start having dreams of traveling, of packing up, of closing up shop, of getting on a plane or a cruise, or they're going someplace they just can't quite remember where, and it's lovely on the other side, but they haven't gotten there yet. And the dreams at the end of life will imagine, help people imagine themselves forward past death into the next stage of existence. There are very few dreams, if any, that come and tell them that there is an abyss and there's nothingness. Even for people who don't believe in an afterlife, it's not so much about saying that the dreams know that there's an afterlife. It's about 
this protective quality, the sense that we are dreaming ourselves into our futures and that those futures at the end of life will help us, um, they help us feel calm and help us feel held. At the very close to the end of life, people will have dreams about loved ones who have died already who are coming back to help them. And they come back as their best selves. These are visitation dreams. They come back as loving um, people who are there to help them move on. In particular, in Western culture, they are uh, relatives. In cultures where there's a stronger religious uh, belief system, then they come back as the traditional religious figures. Um, but they are nearly universally positive, uh, helpful dreams. And when they've, they have done a little bit of research on this, when they've looked at the, the actual death process from people who have had these experiences versus people who haven't, the people who have uh, less pain, they have less anxiety, they need less medication, there's more calmness, there's more peace, and the families who see them being more peaceful are feeling more calm and peaceful themselves. And there's a real sense of these dreams holding, holding them, holding their families, and really holding the staff, holding everybody. So there's some amazing things out there that we're just now scratching the surface of. So we talked some about how dreams affect us. This is how we affect our dreams. Um, the expectations for our dreams and the attention we give our dreaming are the two biggest things as I've talked about here the way we talk about our dreams is really uh, the way we think about our dreams the way we talk to our dreams is going to make all the difference in the kind of dreams that we have whether they are going to overwhelm us and and frighten us or whether we're going to step up and be a partner with them and I think that's all I've got so two organizations the International Association for the Study of Dreams has a website, has online courses in dreams, um, has, like I said, the APA Journal. It's a great organization. And then I run a Toronto Dreamers Meetup, and we do uh, two hours the third Wednesday of the month from 7 to 9. And we each, each week we do about an hour of some kind of dream education and then we do an hour of dream uh, talking about our dreams and doing a little bit of dream dream analysis following a very um strict ethical guideline of the dream belongs to the dreamer the meaning of the dream belongs to the dreamer we can say if it was my dream it would this is what i would get from it this is what i would think it would mean but this is this is my projection of it and that keeps it safe and keeps it uh yeah keeps it really fun so I'm going to come off of uh, stop share. I'm going to stop sharing and open it up for any questions. Thank you so much, Jean. You're welcome. Thank you so much. That was so good. I love this stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Like, I love this. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Ali, do you want to do questions? Yeah, so it looks like we've already got some questions flowing in the chat right now. Okay. Um, yeah, we had one that says, what is the name of the site? Psychologist from Missouri. Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah, I've got it here. I'll try and look it up. Also, if anyone yeah. has any questions um, and they actually want to ask them themselves, um, they're more than welcome to. Um, I can continue asking these questions that are, are spoken in the chat. But if you have a question, you can either just raise your hand or just simply type in the chat like, I have a question. And we'll call on as many of you as we can. That sounds good. Keep going. I'll look it up and we'll... Okay. Um, Philip said, in a dream, is the sense of self a dream object? If so, who is dreaming? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I, it depends on what you mean by dream object, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, it's when I am, when you're aware of yourself, then you are dreaming. You are, you are both the dreamer and and a participant in the dream. But the more lucid you become, the more that role um, really fuzzy, gets fuzzy and you become more of a co-creator of the dream. Wow. And I don't know who's creating it on top of that. I think, I think that's, 
that's one of those questions that can't be answered. <laughs> like, would it become the dream, like, or can you can you change what you are in the dream? Oh yeah, absolutely. But you don't change yourself. I I don't know if that's true or not. I have certainly been I've been an animal. I've been a tree. I've been other people. But I inside I feel like my I am myself. But I am these other things. So you can do hmm. shape shifting in dreams, but um, you don't become fully something else you're still yourself as the dreamer i see thank I you think, i think that's a yeah <laughs> if, I, if i may add something it, it almost sounds like uh, the only constant in your dreams is your sense of self like like no matter what dream you have you're always still you yeah in the sense. so it's yeah, just sort of the only are. constant yeah that's good so we actually have someone um, who raised his hand. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask to unmute you and can ask your question, and then I'll get back to the questions in the chat. Okay. I just want to add one thing. The, um, the name of the psychologist was Michael Nadorf. N-A-D-O, I think, R-F-F. -F. And he does CBT. Yeah. Hi there. My name is Amanda. Yes. Um, sorry for not having a video on. I'm walking. Okay. <laughs> um, but I couldn't pass this up. This is amazing. Um, I'm kind of delving into this on a business slash spiritual level. And I'm just curious yeah. for clarification on credentials. Um, you're obviously a scientist. My science is totally not in this area, but um, how can I use the skills I have and be authentic in my level of knowledge while promoting that to people so that I'm not confusing them or giving them false ideas of you what just level have to I learn. do. You be an autodidact. You learn, learn, learn. That's the best part. I am actually not a scientist. Um, you probably oh. missed that at the beginning. I'm a medical social worker oh, yes. by training. Um, but it's learning. It's just and it's the, I learned a lot from the International Association for the Study of Dreams. It's actually, a, a, I'm on the board of directors there now, um, but they have conferences, they've got online information. They had a whole thing on Brain Awareness Week and had brain researchers who were dream researchers, but uh, heart scientists um, writing about different things. I've used some of that information. I've got handouts from that. So it's just learning, learning, learning until... You find yourself saying, oh, I knew that. Oh, yeah, I knew that. Um, may I offer one last little tidbit then? Um, sure. my, my courses that I've taken are actually specifically geared through um, Jewish uh, dream work. And so um, I didn't even know that it was associated with religions. Of course, being Western, I had no idea. Um, and yeah, being that it's in the scriptures that they have and and such. Um, it was just really amazing to be able to see that there's documents and written records of it in case anybody is curious or looking in that direction. Um, cool. There's a different venue to go that has some structure and history that's probably just as old as the Greek direction you were talking about. Yeah, absolutely. There are a lot of good books out there about dreams in all kinds of uh, religions, um, Islamic, Christian, Judaism. Um, Judaism, there are dream yoga practitioners, there are, you know, so you can find dreams and how all the different traditions have handled them and thought about them. It's wonderful. It is. Very interesting. Back to our chat now. Um, we've had uh, Maya mention that maybe it's the collective consciousness that you have within you that encompasses your waking consciousness and dreaming consciousness. Yeah, it's a possibility. That's that question, right? The, the man who dreamed he was a butterfly, and, but maybe he was a butterfly dreaming he was a man. It's like, we don't know. We don't know for sure. <laughs> I think the big, the big question, right? What's that called? The hard question? Yeah. Uh, is what's the connection between the mind and the brain which comes first and they don't know they don't know how a, a little glob of matter can turn into human consciousness yeah, yeah. 
don't know. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, yeah. yeah, profound question from Harley. I have had dreams about the self, but it was from a third person view. Yes. And then, yes, and that's that's one of those stages of lucidity. It's just where you are you are seeing yourself or you're seeing kind of what's going on. Sometimes people dream like it's a movie kind of playing out in front of them and they're not even in it. They're just kind of watching things happen. That's still, that's still us in our dream. We're just, we're just more of an observer. We're less in the action. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Perhaps consciousness itself is a type of dream. We are just a bunch of chemical reactions and meat sacks. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> and, ooh, how do we get into that? I'm not sure what that's in reference to. So I don't know. Yeah. I'm going to go on. Uh, Maya, again, uh, that's also trippy. But this conscious entity doesn't want to just be a meat sack. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That was really informative by Sarah. Um, and then Harley, which interpretation of the psychoanalytic approach to dream analysis is more accurate? Oh, well, the psychoanalytic is one approach to dreams. There are other approaches to dreams that follow cognitive behavioral or gestalt or um, phenomenology. Um, there are a lot of different approaches to dreams. I tend not to do so much psychoanalytical, but I, I like um, spending time with the experience of the dream, how the dream makes me feel how and kind of how it's resonating in my life, which is a little different. Um, there are linguistic approaches to dreams where you just play with the puns, you play with the metaphors and the narratives that are there. Um, so yeah, does that answer that question? There's, there's more there's, to this question. Oh, there's more? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Does the latent content depict universal symbols and images in the collective unconscious, or are symbols and imagery largely subjective? Uh, both. <laughs> I, think, I think what happened is the collective unconscious that, that Jung was talking about, he put in terms of those Greek and Roman myths. And so in a way, we're still struggling with, you know, is this the Cassandra complex? Is this the Oedipal complex? Is this, we're, we're looking at these things. But it's kind of both because, uh, how do I say this? I don't like dream dictionaries because they tend to say, you know, if you dream of a tree, it means this. If you dream of a basement, it means that. And sometimes they do, but often they don't. We all build our own dream dictionaries through our own personal histories. So if I'm dreaming, if I tell you all to picture, last night I had a dream, I was sitting by a tree next to the river and my dog came up to me. It's like, if you all imagine that, you're all gonna see different rivers and different trees and different animals different types of dogs because you're drawing from your own individual lives and that's what makes dream images really potent is because it's not just a dog it's the dog that that i loved the most when i was five and when i was five this is when i was facing that issue that i am now facing today so the dream images are are completely personal and completely unique and at the same time, there are some images, some um, feelings that come that are basic human and have a universality to them. Uh, life and death, uh, mothers, fathers. There are things that cross cultures and times. Um, but it, you couldn't say it's, you know, I was driving my car and that's a, an archetype. But traveling, it could be an archetype. So the journey could be an archetype. The car, though, is specific to my life. Does that make sense? It's, so it's kind of a mix of both. And being able to play in both just gives you a wider range of how you want to respond to it. 
And because I'm so used to talking to people who are so new to this, I want to tell you that it's not always necessary, that you get, to, you get to play with the dreams as much or as little as you want. You get to throw back the ones that don't make any sense. If it's something important, it'll come back in a new way, and you'll have another dream that'll make you pay attention to it. But the uh -huh. dreams themselves, are they really are a conversation with us. And so however much we get from it um, is really... It's, it's all we need to do. There's people who get so caught up in dreams sometimes that they will, they will analyze a dream for a week and never get to the bottom of it because there are so many different twists and turns and, and metaphors and symbols and things. And, and that's fine. If they want to play that way, that's fine. You could also stay on the surface of it and say, this is enough for me right now. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, a quick follow-up question, if you don't mind. Um, would you, I mean, I guess because I was kind of talking about like universal dreams and the subjective meaning of dreams, would you necessarily throw away like a dream dictionary? I don't throw them away, but I would read, I would read a few of them. There's a couple of really good ones right now that are just, um, oh, I should have brought them. I'll, I'll see if I can send them to, um, Philip, but there's a couple that are that are that really do talk about the archetypal images that come up across cultures across time, and they they have images and of art and cave paintings and sculptures that depict these particular images um, from around the world for the last five thousand years, and it is really you know it's amazing to see that and to see kind of how how psychologists look at that or how unions do that but i wouldn't throw them out i think i'd just read a few of them so you can start getting a sense of kind of how different authors mm -hmm. play with those images and then trust your own if they don't fit you they don't fit as jeremy taylor said it was a wonderful he was a wonderful dream uh explorer and and um lecturer he said you're, you're kind of looking for that aha feeling you're looking for that feeling it's like oh my god that is what it means you read it and it feels familiar and you can feel it connecting in. Wow. If it doesn't feel that, if you're trying to fit yourself into a frame, that's not going to work. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. We've got an interesting turn in the question. So yeah. uh, Laura says, I'm wondering what the differences are between dreaming and psychedelic experiences especially as psychedelic therapy is becoming part of end-of-life care. Yeah, there is a difference. Yeah. Um, I, I would be talking off the top of my head a little too much. I think you know, the difference is the difference between natural and, and um, pushed or forced. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be, and I, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> I think I think there are some dreams that uh, that can give you that sense of oneness with the creative transformative. Um, the psychedelics give you that same feeling, but without the work of trying to learn how to do the dreaming. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. Can you speak a little about precognitive dreams and what is yeah. precognitive about them? What is precognitive about them? So I wrote a book about this. This was one of the books I wrote about how to have having precognitive dreams or premonitions in uh, Western culture, <laughs> how you live with them. Um, but they really are dreams about events that uh, you were not expecting. You were you can't really foresee through intuition or through planning or through any of the general ways that we think about the future. And then they happen. And there's this sense of a very strong sense of connection between whatever that connecting event is and the dream that you had and it kind of start it startles people and it um, uh, makes the depending on their um, what they believe about the experience it can either feel beautiful or it can feel quite um, disorienting mm -hmm. but it's it's not something where you could have predicted it um, and I don't know I have a good example of, of those. There were people who dreamed about the 9-11 uh, 
thing that happened in New York, uh, 2001. Um, and they didn't dream about exactly what happened, but they dreamed about aspects of it. So somebody dreamed about a tower falling down. Somebody dreamed about a plane crashing. Somebody dreamed about being in a control tower and watching a plane crash. And it felt like they were dreaming about kind of the emotional impact of the event. Um, and so it felt like precognitive in that way. But often the precognitive dreams are more personal. So I had a dream about a house um, when I was a child. And then when I was a teenager, my parents bought that house, which I hadn't been in before <laughs> until we actually got to the house and saw it at an open house and I recognized it. Um, and so from that decided we probably would buy that house. And I started making my plans <laughs> to get the best bedroom. Cause you know, there was a teenage bedroom there that was just like, wow, it was so good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question or not. Some people have precognitive dreams of, of people they love who are ill or who are dying. Uh, they have dreams of accidents. Um, they can be really disorienting. They can feel like, it can feel like it's your dream because it is your dream, but somehow it connects to the outer world in a way that is not, um, it's not usual enough to have a cultural holding for the experience. And so it throws people off. Yeah. We have another question right after, basically the same. I've had dreams that have situations that actually do come true in the future. Yeah. So that goes back. To hi, hi, this is for Alicia. I'm in California and that was my question. So I wanted to elaborate a little bit more. Um, ever since I was a child, I've had this, these dreams that would just come true. And as a young child, I was always afraid that whenever yeah. I had, they weren't all the time, just um, when they did, they actually came true and a lot of them were not as good. So I prayed, I prayed yeah. to God and said, please take this away. And it went away yeah. for oh, a long yeah. time. But, yeah. but um, as I became an adult, it came back. And so I'm not too afraid of them anymore. Like if something does happen, but mm. I just wanted to like, get your perspective on if that's yeah. common or even as children having those sort of mm -hmm. abilities. It is, it is. I think when I first started looking into this, I heard that premonitions, um, they did a, a study of Winnipeg, which is kind of a Midwestern mid-sized town. And they found 20% of the people there were talking about having premonitions or precognitive experiences. And so I went to a choir that I was singing in and, uh, and just said, I'm looking for people to interview if any of you had this experience and 20% had had that experience. So it's not, it's not uncommon. Um, the problem is, is really just, we don't have a cultural holder for it. So it's really important. The, the book that I wrote, Premonitions in Daily Life, is talking more about premonitions than precognitive dreams. But it really, what it comes down to is the way you make sense of it is going to influence not just how you respond to it but what you end up seeing so for instance i interviewed a man who was a police officer and he said my dreams my precognition my premonitions help me catch bad guys and they help me stay safe and that's it that's what they're for because i have a dangerous job he said my brother does not have a dangerous job he doesn't have precognitive dreams i know he doesn't because he doesn't have a dangerous job and by god his premonitions only came to help him with bad guys and help him stay safe. He never got premonitions about his family or about anything else going on in his life. So that it's a conversation he's having with his premonitions the same way that we have conversations about our dream, with our dreams. He was laying down what he expected, what he believed, what he thought was gonna happen and his premonitions responded to that, I think. So, yeah. So finding a good story, finding a good story to hold on to them, to say I'm strong enough to have these, I'm curious enough to try and figure this out. I really want to see this interplay or I'm done. I don't want to see this anymore. Or some people say, I don't want to see it about my family. I'll see it about anything else, just not about my family. There's lots of ways you can respond to them. Wow. Does that help? Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> 
So next we've got Jen. I think Jen's still here. Yes. I'm a polyphagic sleeper. So I sleep a full seven hours, but it's broken up over 24 hours. Might you know how this would affect my sleep cycle and brain activity and ability to go into REM, deep sleep, etc.? No idea. <laughs> no idea. Sorry. I can say, I'll say one thing, which is that they think that part of the reason why our sleep, they think our sleep patterns changed in the oh gosh, between the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, like the late 18th, late 17th century, late somewhere in there, when lights came, when they, they found lanterns, when they started using gas, when they started lighting up the night, before that, we had always slept in four-hour increments. And they just found this a few years ago, where they found actually references to it everywhere, first sleep, second sleep. And nobody really paid attention to what that meant until they figured out it meant that People slept for four or five hours, they'd wake up for a couple of hours, they'd talk to each other, they'd make love, they'd make plans, they'd be sitting in the dark, and then they'd go back to sleep for another four or five hours. And that, that was the way human beings slept right up until the night became uh, something they could navigate with lights. And then we switched to an eight hour cycle. So it's a long answer to say that I don't know that it's unhealthy. Um, and that it may actually be closer to what we what we do naturally. It's certainly true that as older adult, as adults get older, we tend to have shorter sleep cycles and have two of them. So you'll have more people going to having four or five hours at night and then having a two or three hour nap in the afternoon. But that's that's later in life. It's still later for me too. <laughs> Interesting. But also, yeah. not, like. Um, when I went to Italy, like that's was common, you know, we'd sleep at like the hottest part of the day because yeah. it was too hot to like be outside to exist in the world. So we just like to do anything. And else. shops were closed and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've got a comment. Dreams are a pretty big part of the superstitious culture in Myanmar, where I come from. A lot of the traditional shaman rituals make use of them. Yes. Yes, and I, I, it's that question, is it superstition, is it, is it, it's like superstitious is a great word for, is the, is the kind of the pejorative word we use to say not real, whereas there may be some ways of looking at that as being part of shared reality with all the pluses and minuses that come with that, not saying that that makes it better than the way we look at things, that there definitely are uh, cultures that do a lot of dreams and shamanic dreaming where they are like hurting each other. They're going, you know, after each other with spells and curses and things. So I'm mm -hmm. not saying that it's, it's better. I'm just saying that that's, um, that there is, there are whole cultures that are kind of built on that as being the, the base for reality. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all so interesting. We've got a question from Andrew. Do you think biblical figures like Joseph and Exodus develop the ability to read dreams? Do you think the ability can be achieved with a greater sense of self or great clarity? I think yes to the second question. Uh -huh. That we, as we get better at understanding ourselves and getting more clarity and wisdom in our lives, it becomes easier to see over time kind of our own patterns for our own dreams and easier to see. I think the Bible uh, has wonderful, wonderful stories of dreams in them. And that in a lot of those stories, the reason those particular stories have, have lasted throughout the last couple thousand years is because there was a culture that said, yes, this is possible, and that they considered the dreams as a part of the divine or a part of the way that we can um, reach the divine and God. Wow. Um, and that's, that's kind of what made the people who were putting the Bible together and deciding this story, not that story, that that was part of those decisions. It was reflecting the power of dreams. And you know, now the Christian church, or after that, the Christian church got very, uh, you know, revelations is closed. <laughs> we no longer are allowing this. And so they started looking at dreams as being more satanic. They started talking about dreams as being more satanic than divine and trying to 
stop the greater population from feeling like they could have that direct experience with the divine as they didn't want any more prophets to come forward and overthrow the church. It worked really well. Mm. <laughs> wow. So um, we have <laughs> a comment. I practiced Holtic, lucid dreaming, Maoism. More of a discipline and can be used for healing and manifestation. And what? Manifestation. Cool. Healing and manifestation. Cool. Know. Yeah. Anything about that? Uh, Just yeah. enough to say that's great. <laughs> cool. <Yeah. laughs> uh, we have Philip. Can you meditate in a dream? In a dream? I don't know. Probably. I think I think you can do anything in a dream. And I think if you are a regular meditator and you want to meditate in a dream, it would be really interesting to see what happens. Yeah. Right? Um, further question, can you dream a new color? A new color? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Another great question. Maybe. Maybe. Like in reference to that, are you only dreaming what you've witnessed in your waking life oh no there's definitely ways that dreams are are creative they're pulling from waking life they're pulling from they're pulling from everything but but yeah you can absolutely dream things that you've never seen before so essentially you could dream a new color then okay yeah there are people who well like paul mccartney a song yesterday came to him in a dream it took him a couple months of humming it to people to make sure it wasn't something he had heard Mm. Wow. Yeah. Um, are we always dreaming on a subliminal level? Uh, I don't. I don't know. They. They think I've read that. Um, we definitely are still half dreaming in the first couple of hours that we wake up, which is what lets us remember stuff. So, and part of what that. I need that cup of coffee to get going in the morning is all about it's it's a way to kind of get our brains to go back into just physical physical life going to focus in but that fuzzy feeling that you have sometimes and you're not quite awake is really true because you're not quite awake <laughs> yeah in reference to philip's question if i'm colorblind can i dream in color i they don't know but it's possible. Deaf people talk about hearing in dreams sometimes. People who are blind sometimes talk about images. Um, yeah, it's all those questions. Of what's possible in dreams? Yeah. yeah. Is there a reason why some people remember their dreams more than others? Yes, practice. Practice and interest. I want to remember my dreams. It really comes down to just, I want to remember my dreams. I had a precognitive dream when I was five and it made me really want to remember my dreams. And I wanted to see if that happened again and what would happen if it happened again. And I spent my waking life thinking about my dreaming life. And I think I developed uh, a pretty strong little neural pathway there <laughs> from the two. So yeah, practice, practice, practice. Uh, um, we yeah. have a thank you comment. From Garth. I believe they left. Um, Danny says, Do you have any tips to help people lucid dream? There are some tips. I think the best one is, is a kind of, um, you do it during the waking life, a uh, waking day, because that's, and what you do is, is you pick something that you see a lot and you, you practice taking yourself out of your daily ordinary consciousness and into kind of a metacognitive state for a minute. So for some people, it's when you see, when I see my hands for as many times as I can, when I see my hands, I'm going to look at them and say, am I awake? Am I asleep? Am I awake or am I dreaming? And just doing that. So you're kind of taking yourself out of the, the blur of the moment and kind of putting yourself into this cog metacognitive state. You're training your brain to start asking yourself, am I awake? Am I dreaming? With the thought and the, the practice then that when you see your dreams in your, when you see your hands in your dream, it will click in that question again and you'll be able to say, oh, no, I'm dreaming now. So some people use hands, some people use uh, light switches, um, ways to test. If the light switch works, then I'm awake. If the light switch doesn't work, then I'm dreaming. 
and there was a long conversation once which I just I found hysterical <laughs> of um, people saying if I can, if you want to check if you're lucid dreaming don't you can check because you can fly right but don't jump off anything just just jump up just jump up from the ground don't jump off anything because because if you're awake that's just not gonna be good <laughs> and I think they were serious but it was funny <laughs> you should be able to tell you're awake or you're sleeping when you're awake enough yeah to know that <laughs> <laughs> there's you had mentioned the light switch thing and there's this um this animated movie called waking life yes isn't it wonderful uh, yeah it is. yeah if anyone um is interested that's a really good movie yeah um, it is very good yeah and it's it's um, now it's a little dated because you know some people can dream about light switches working just fine <laughs> some people say if i can't read then it means that i'm dreaming and other people say i can i can read and write in dreams easily because i'm a writer so it really depends on what you do. It's uh, yeah. Wow. Um, we've got Harley who said, um, you know, not to speak on behalf of, of you. Uh, just wanted to add that blind people have dreams that are not visual and are more auditory and sometimes tactical. Yes. Yes. In neuroscience, so I trust Good. that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, there are some articles. Sorry, were you going to say something? Okay. Um, Maya said, there are some articles published by David Sampson on some evolutionary explanations on sleep. So this would co cover um, polyphagic sleep and biphagic sleep patterns. He is also really great for understanding how to detach natural sleep from the sleep patterns that are also being influenced more so by cultural influences. So an interesting uh, yeah and cool. uh, oh he's also at U of T so that's interesting oh, David Sampson yeah David Sampson on okay. uh, evolutionary explanations yeah thank you Maya I'm writing it down yeah me too <laughs> um, and then we have Harley, that says, I have heard that in expert meditators, they can go longer without sleep because their brain activity is similar to that of REM, namely more delta waves. From your experience with dreams, does this view hold any merit? Also great. One. Oh, I don't know. It's a great question. Um, I, don't, I don't know if meditation can take the place of, of sleep dreams or not. I think yeah, mostly because I haven't wanted to do that. I like dreams. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I don't know. It's great. Interesting. I'd, I'd like to hear more about that from Harley. Yeah, um, yeah. Can meditation uh, take the place of sleep? Yeah, essentially because the brain waves. Like, it's not yeah. taking a place, but maybe meditators do need less sleep. So um, Maybe. Yeah. We have one final question from Maya. Can you talk about when sleepwalking occurs during the sleep cycle and how is sleepwalking related to dreaming or lucid dreaming? Oh yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a disorder. And basically the way it works is that when we're asleep and when we go into dreaming, there's a chemical that is released that paralyzes our muscles, which is really, really good. <laughs> Because without that, we would be sleepwalking and sleep talking and getting up. And I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Sleepwalk with me. Wonderful, wonderful movie. Mike Birbiglia, who's a stand up comic. Yeah. And has a sleep disorder. And he will actually, without waking up, he will act out his dreams to the point where he, he actually threw himself out of a plate glass window at a hotel he was at and ended up in the emergency room. Um, and worked with a sleep disorder specialist who, you know, he's on medication for it now, but he also sleeps in a sleeping bag with mittens on his hands yeah. so that he can't get out and hurt himself. Um, so that's one where that, that chemical just isn't, isn't flowing. Yeah. It's a great movie though. He's very funny about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he really shows how the stress, the, the added stress in his life really did add the, to the pressure of the dreams. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Does anyone else have any more questions? I, I wrote down a question actually. Yeah. yeah. So you had mentioned um, the continuum. 
um, of lucidity. Um, yeah. And so that last stage that you have mentioned, you know, consciously co-creating the dream. And so I was just curious what you meant by co-creating if essentially we are creating the dream, who yeah. would we be co-creating it with? I don't know, but I don't think anyone's gotten to the point where they are not within some structure. Yeah. Even if they're changing the structure, the structure is still there. So there's a co-creation quality to that. Oh, okay. That makes I just, so I don't know. It's yeah. like, who's the eye that's thinking the eye? It's like, <laughs> if there's a, there's something that's holding it, um, which maybe, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Well, then um, I have a question, I guess, just yeah. like hypothetical. If someone were maybe like a great meditator was in that state of, of complete like oneness, it seems uh -huh. like, you know, there's like no almost structure like it's limitless it's infinite would there yeah. reflect that reality so essentially there'd be no structure i don't know i don't know there's uh, a i don't know i mean it's it's like you're getting to the limits of of what really is known there there are people who talk about having lucid dreams where they move out of a sense of space and into a sense of geometric shapes so they're not anymore talking about in particular uh, sets or settings it's all geometric shapes but that in itself may be a dream image they have set forth to show themselves that they are now past images it's like we don't we don't really know where that comes from so yeah. i don't know that there's i don't know what's out there oh yeah, yeah. it's a great question though i just i don't you know because this whole thing about the geometric shapes came up and now everybody's got geometric shapes which yeah. tells me that we're dreaming the geometric shapes just like we dream about the settings mm -hmm. and it may be a way for us to understand that we're kind of beyond settings and we're trying we're looking for the basic structure and basic structures are geometry so maybe we're we're building it that way but maybe it feels like it's still something we're doing maybe that has something to do with this collective unconscious and sometimes it might though it's uh it it could be it could be it feels uh geometric shapes feels very culturally bound to me okay i don't know i don't know if it is or not oh. okay <laughs> anyone else have any last thoughts ideas questions um yeah um so one kind of question is like we can kind of dream of like almost anything, right? Like, would it be possible to imagine like a new sense in a dream or imagine like, you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Or a new dimension. Could yeah. be dreaming six dimensions. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Have you experienced anything like it? Um, no, I think the most, the most I've ever done personally is that sense of, um, there being no space, there being nothing. And it freaked me out. It completely, it was, it felt like if you're swimming and you're reaching for the edge and you can't quite find the edge and you just keep reaching frantic. It was like, if I had arms, they would have been flailing frantically looking for the edge of me. It was just like this expansive hmm. thing. And, and it was uh, disconcerting. <laughs> so I haven't had that experience since. I don't know that I need it in order to feel like I'm challenging myself enough. So I don't know if that makes sense. But yeah, I think I think really this not even the sky is the limit. I was going to say the sky is the limit, but I'm looking at a picture of you with you know a million galaxies. So. <laughs> 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 I don't know. I yeah, there's there's more than we know. Yeah. Very yeah. expansive, expansive ideas, expansive talk. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you so much. Everyone's expressing such gratitude here. Oh, you're welcome. I'm very, very pleased. I had a great time. Yeah. yeah and if cool. you ever need to talk to me again, just let Philip know. I'm yeah, I might join the, I'm probably going to join the meetup and stuff if people want to join cool. the meetup, you know, like. Yeah.
yeah, yeah. that'd be great right now it's free it's online and free so it's um it definitely will have dream uh, work in it as well as uh, dream topics mm. yeah good cool thank you so much you're welcome okay if that's it i'm just gonna go bye everybody have okay. good dreams damn it have bye. good dreams <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Bye. I wish you the best. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Peace. Hello. Hello. Hi, Abdullah.